London news agents. Call it next week, call it for May the 2nd. The country, I think, overwhelmingly wants change. They want to put an end to 14 years of chaos and division and decline and have the chance to usher in a decade of national renewal. So I say to the Prime Minister, call it, have the backbone to call it, allow this to go to a general election on May the 2nd. We're ready. We've got a very positive case to put to the country and the sooner I can make that case, the better. That is Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, calling for an election and calling for it now, well, in early May. It would be odd if he didn't say we want an election now. We don't want an election for ages. But I think that the rumour mill at Westminster is slightly going crazy that it will now be a May election. And Rishi Sunak isn't quite ruling it out. If that is the case, we are on the cusp within a week or so of a general election campaign which will be a frenzied one, probably almost as frenzied as this week has been. But this week's politics isn't over either. I've been catching up with Keir Starmer about this week's politics and focusing in particular on this question about whether Diane Abbott, who by his own admission has received more racism and abuse probably than any other member of parliament in history, should be allowed to be a Labour MP once again. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Lewis. And I have just got back from, of all places, the National Theatre. Obviously, my Where natural, else? My, Your natural well, home. My spiritual home, John. Yeah. Of course, treading the boards. The thespian goodle. <laughs> I don't know what on earth ever gave you that impression. <laughs> and I was catching up with a man who's probably not quite a thespian, Keir Starmer. This was an interview that I've done for LBC, for LBC Drive. And he is there because he had a load of arts and cultural announcements. He said he wants to prioritise arts and culture in a way he says that the Conservative Party has not done. He says there's a way of unlocking lots of growth. He thinks that working class kids don't get the arts and culture education that they need. And if you want to listen to all of that bit, you can listen to LBC Drive. That'll have been out by the time you hear this. But for our purposes, we wanted to focus a little bit, obviously, on the politics of the week, which has obviously been dominated by Frank Hester, the £10 million donation, a donation, according to Tortoise, by the way, we learned on Thursday, could actually have been £15 million, that so the Conservative Party have an extra £5 million that they have not yet disclosed from him. So I want to talk to him about that and about Diane Abbott and whether or not she should be allowed back into the Labour Party. Here's part of that interview. I just want to get your general reflections on this week, because it has been quite a week, it has. politically. Um, can you believe that in 2024... At the top of British politics and media, we've spent the entire week basically debating whether or not a man who says that seeing a black woman makes him judge or think in a certain way of all other black women is racist or not. I mean, that dis personally speaking, that disturbs me. Does it disturb you? I think it's disturbing that that answer couldn't be given or that question couldn't be answered in a nanosecond because it was obviously racist. It was obviously misogynistic. And yet the Prime Minister sent his troops out, his MPs out, um, the morning before last, to make the contrary argument that somehow it was rude, but not otherwise uh, racist or misogynistic, until he was then forced to change his position. Um, he didn't voluntarily change it, he was forced to change it by his own MPs. And still is clinging on to the £10 billion pound, million pound donation from this individual instead of doing the right thing, which is to give it back. Well, just on that today, Tortoise is reporting that the Conservative Party is sitting on an extra £5 million pounds from Hester, as yet undisclosed. If that's true, what do you make of that and what do you think should be done? Well, if that's true, it makes the situation worse because it begins to give an explanation as to why Rishi Sunak will not hand this money back. You think that's why he won't hand it back? Yes, this is a significant if it's million. contribution to their electoral campaign um, and he won't hand it back. Now, this is the same Prime Minister who took it on himself to do a broadcast, essentially walking into our living rooms two weeks ago Friday at 10 to 6, to parade as a unifier and a man that could bring people together. Amongst the comments, not just racist and misogynistic about Diane Abbott, this is a donor who said she should be shot. Well, there's only one answer to returning that money. It's a test for Rishi Sunak. He's failing that test. And if this report is true, I think it raises serious questions about what his real motivation is in clinging on to that money uh, in the current environment. I mean, isn't it time here, isn't it time maybe to use this as an opportunity to look at the situation around party funding? I mean, this is the guy, this is a guy who basically, you could argue, 
is being allowed to be racist or his racism is being excused, at least to some extent, because he's rich and because he's giving to a political party. Isn't it time to look again at party funding? Uh, two, two things there. I mean, uh, you know, the debate about party funding has been going on a very, very long time and it's quite difficult when the economy is as broken as it currently is to make the argument for families and individuals who are suffering a cost of living crisis, can't afford their bills, to say there should be state funding for political parties. But I, I do want to give a better and fuller answer to that, which is that doesn't mean that political parties shouldn't put um, in place standards and requirements for donations that they accept. Yes, this donation has been made. We now know that this is a man who uses racist and misogynistic language and says that Diane Abbott should be shot. Um, that does not mean that Rishi Sunak has to say, well, um, I must accept it. He could say, uh, the right thing to do is to return the money. It's a tough decision, but I'm going to take it. Do you, do you think contrition is important when discussing racial problems? If someone's made a mistake, you think contrition is important? I think it's important in all walks of life. Um, here, the problem with that part of the argument for the Prime Minister is, insofar as Hester, the donor, has said sorry, he said sorry for being rude. He's not said yeah. sorry for being racist and misogynistic. I so it, it, even it, I mean, I don't want to live in a world where nobody can say sorry for a mistake they've made. Well, I indeed. I, I really and, don't. And so I'm thinking, I'm actually not thinking about Hester in this case. I'm thinking about Diane Abbott herself, mm. because of course, she wrote a letter to The Guardian, which you describe, many people describe this as being anti-Semitic, that it was problematic. Um, she's apologized for it. She's shown genuine contrition. Given that, are you minded to say, that perhaps she should be let back into the Parliamentary Labour Party now? I would just gently say the abuse against Diane Abbott that's gone on for many, many years mm. is abhorrent and um, she suffered more abuse than any other MP, uh, usually racist and misogynistic, but all sorts of abuse. And she's having she's, to deal with all of this alone. She's been a trailblazer uh, uh, as a black MP, paving the way for other people and all that is to be applauded. There's the separate question of what she herself said and the investigation into that, which needs to be resolved, I accept that. I don't think you can just conflate the two. When we finished PMQs yesterday, when the questioning finished, um, I saw that Diane Abbott was in the chamber, so instinctively I went over to her to check that she was all right. Um, but we can't just conflate the two. That process needs to complete. But it's been well, 11 months, hasn't it? It's been a long, it, why has it, it taken it, it so has. long, Sakir, why? One of the changes I made when I became leader was to take the leader out of that process and make it truly independent because under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, all sorts of problems letter. happened. It was one letter, why has it taken 11 months? Andy MacDonald, he had a case, yeah. it's just been resolved, it took five months. Rupert Huck had a case, it took five months. Yeah. This is one letter, it's taken 11 months. What is there left to investigate? Well, there are aspects of the process which take time, and it could be a general election in, in five weeks. No. She doesn't know if she's going to be a, an MP anymore. It, it needs to be resolved, and um, of course it does. That is an independent process. It's not my process, uh, and I'm not going to interfere with it because I think that's a slippery slope. But on the general proposition that it needs to be resolved, I accept that. Mm. I don't think you could simply say because another case took X months. Every case is different, what they're looking it's at, what the resolution <laughs> is. <laughs> what could you still be investigating after 11 months? It was one letter. Yeah, but it was, I mean, I, you know, it was a, uh, a, a pretty offensive letter. I mean, that's been well, fine. And then perhaps you could just say, was. "Well, that's it. You're not coming back." It, I'm afraid it, it, this wasn't just a, a, a sort of casual remark. But she's having to deal with all of this. I mean, you've alluded to the, the terrible experience that she's had in the past, and indeed now yeah. she must be having. She's having to deal with that alone. I mean, have, yeah. has your office been in touch with her? Oh office? yeah, of course, of course. Um, my office has been in touch with her. The whips have been in touch with her. I've been in touch with her. I, I reached out to her. Uh, on Tuesday morning and in addition of course I want as soon as I saw she was in the chamber um, as a human being I wanted to go over and speak to her and make sure that she's all right but I, and I don't think it follows that because there happens to be an investigation into something that she herself said that somehow I or others say she can't be supported but there's another in relation to this abuse. There's another, two element. Different things. there's another element to this Kira as well. I'm looking at, uh, at an, e an email here sent to your party supporters last night and it says this we are fuming 10 million pounds in there, that's the Tories election fund from this man, and they're not giving it back. They're so desperate to cling to power, they'll happy ignore the, happily ignore the racism. That's why we're asking you to chip in to our general election fund. You're happy to tout for cash off the back of this racism row, not even allow her back into the party at the same time. 
Do you think that speaks of much integrity? Oh, they're two different things completely. I have no apology for saying that if you want this sort of thing to end, where those that use racist language, misogynistic language, are bankrolling a rotten Tory party, if you want that to end, the Labour Party has to win the election. The Conservative Party we have to win from the this racist man's money. In a sense, so are you. We, we want to put an end to that. We can only do that for good by winning the election. And we have to fund our winning the election. I, so I make no apologies for saying, if you want to root out this rotten approach to politics, this rotten Tory party um, that is permitting and allowing and facilitating this with a spineless prime minister won't give the money back. If you want to end that, well, you can't just say you want to end it. You've got to elect a different government, and that's a Labour government. And, um, of course, I would invite anybody who wants to be part of that, financially or otherwise, to work with us to bring about what I hope will be a major reset point in politics where we can put this kind of behaviour behind us uh, and look again uh, to the nation that I know we can be. Finally, since you mentioned it, talking about the general election, Westminster, you know, is awash with rumours that next week the Prime Minister could announce a May general election. Is that what that's what you want? You want it, to, as soon as possible, on May, you are inviting him now to call it next week? Yes, I am. Call it next week. Call it for May the 2nd. Uh, the country, I think, overwhelmingly wants change. They want to put an end to 14 years of chaos and division and decline and have the chance to usher in a decade of national renewal. So I say to the Prime Minister, call it. Um, have the backbone to call it, allow this to go to a general election on May the 2nd. We're ready. Uh, let's test those arguments. Uh, we've got a very positive case to put to the country, and the sooner I can make that case, the better. Keir Starmer, thank you so much. Thank you. So an interesting line, I thought, that Keir Starmer was trying to walk there, which is to say, look, this in review into her behaviour and what she did and the anti-Semitic letter, etc., etc. That's entirely separate. I have nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's taking a long time. But nevertheless, the Tories are guilty as charged for being racist and taking money from a racist. Yeah, and look, the accusation about Diane Abbott towards Starmer and his office is that for all that he says that this is an independent investigation and, you know, it needs to sort of resolve in its own time. Those on the left and those around Diane Abbott feel very strongly that this is about Keir Starmer himself and about, it's a factional question. And they just want Diane Abbott, who of course was a close ally of Jeremy Corbyn, she'd been on the left of the party for decades. They just want her and they want others like her out. And they say that, you know, Keir Starmer, with some justification, has controlled the party factionally with an iron fist and that this is just part of that pattern of behaviour. And I have to say, I mean, just separately, I, during that interview, he was the most relaxed and confident I've seen him, actually. I've interviewed him quite a few times, and he has, there's no doubt, he's gained confidence and kind of self-composure in a way over time. But I thought his answers on that were pretty feeble. I mean, the idea that, like, it's taken 11 months. It was one letter. Either say, you know what, you actually just crossed the line when you suggested that Irish or travellers or whatever it happens to be is lesser than that experienced by black people and therefore there's a sort of hierarchy of racism. You could just say, sorry, there's no coming back for you now. But they haven't. They've just allowed it to dangle. And, and fester. Allow, and fester. And the idea that it takes 11 months to make a decision about that one letter, and she has apologised for it, she has shown contrition, but the idea it takes 11 months is just risible. And I also think it's fascinating, the whole thing about the election timing. Because... If you were looking at this objectively, you've sort of landed from somewhere else. You've been away for a few months. You saw the state of the opinion polls. You would say the least obvious thing in the world to do right now, Rishi Sunak, is call an election. Well, you're 20 points behind. And exactly. You've got nine months of your mandate still to run. Yeah. I mean, and then there are lots of, and as you know, John, we've had this discussion many, many times. And, and that is always, that's the logic I've always comes out back to, which is that why risk, well, why accept certain defeat now when you can have almost certain defeat later? The, the, but it is true. All the Westminster WhatsApp groups right now, which some of which we'll be members of, and there'll be lots more that we're not, are absolutely a flurry with all of this. And Sunak has done nothing in some ways to dispel it because... At various times over the last week or two, he's refused to engage on it. Today, he's done an interview where he said that his working assumption continues to be the second half of the year. The logic that's been put to me, there's a lot of Labour people who do expect him to announce it next week. And the logic that it's been put to me about it is, well, 
Sunak is worried that his internal political position is going to continue to deteriorate, that he's definitely going to face a challenge, that the May locals are going to be dreadful, that the Conservative grassroots therefore want him to go now or go go in May rather than leave it to the end of the year, and that they can get the Rwanda bill through Parliament next week. And then he puts the podium outside Downing Street and says, we're the ones who want to stop the boats. We've just passed the Rwanda bill and the Labour Party doesn't. And you try and make it a single issue election and you escape a te- potentially terrible summer of constant boat arrivals which punctures that narrative so that's the logic and it does have a logic it does can i just say for the record that i advanced the logic of this case two months ago <laughs> on precisely that basis that he will try and make it a single issue well, election you you and- are a savant john we know this <laughs> john sopel savant that's what i'm <laughs> going to put on my business card um but i also think it shows the absolute desperation <laughs> that it's like saying Look, the building has been shaken by an earthquake. We can either run out of it now before it collapses or wait for it to collapse. But either way, it's not exactly a kind of for England and St. George, let's go into battle. When you are so far behind in the polls, when your party is divided, when morale is at rock bottom. And my God, if this is the moment you choose when you could wait another few months, it just suggests that everything is still going to get worse the longer you leave it. And that must be a pretty awful position for the kind of smart people around Sunak who are busy election planning. And if they actually don't intend to call it next week, again, it's yet more political uselessness from number 10 because they're again allowing the speculation to build. If it's not going to happen next week, it's definitely not going to happen next week or the week after, then they need to, they could just say, look, this isn't happening. Everybody stop getting so excited. We've said it's going to be the second half of the year. That's still our plan, etc. But they're not. They're allowing it to build. So, of course, if they do withdraw from it now, they look for it. They look scared. And that is, again, more bad politics. It is, of course, possible that the reason that they're allowing to do that is that they haven't actually decided yet, which is, again, you can't rule that out as a possibility that they're still sort of mulling it over this week and into the weekend. There is one other thing that someone pointed out to me this afternoon, John, which is intriguing. But our old friend Sir Robbie Gibb (laughs) has just today been reappointed to the BBC board for the next four years. So he, again, to remind people, he was Theresa May's chief of staff before that, he was head of politics at the BBC, and he's certainly been, um, he, he's been a controversial figure at the BBC, let's put it that way, as accusations that he has tried to tilt coverage in favour of the Conservative Party. Um, and it was put to me by someone that if you were thinking about going to the polls quite soon, this would be a very good kind of part of your kind of last acts, the things that you were just putting in place before you go to the country, that it sort of indicated that they're just going to put their guy in place for the next four years, which taking up their last opportunity to do so. Might be nothing, but it's an interesting theory put to me. And today we had Michael Gove coming out, setting out what is extremism. And of course, unable to answer the question about Frank Hester and whether what he said is extremist. We'll be talking about that in a moment. Well, today we've had Michael Gove coming out and trying to give a government definition of what extremism is. And, you know, the other week, Rishi Sunak came out of Downing Street in the afternoon on a Friday afternoon and gave a speech about extremism and how there was a kind of mob mentality taking over and liberal democracy itself was sort of being imperiled by some of the Islamist voices that were protesting over Israel and Gaza. The history of this goes back even further. I mean, I think Blair was the first person to try and talk about what extremism looks like or define it. Theresa May had a go. David Cameron had a go. And now Michael Gove has had a crack at it. But of course, it's still plagued by the story of this week that What the government is saying is there are certain groups, if they believe that they are somehow Islamist or extremist, they're not going to be able to get government grants. At the same time that the Conservative Party is taking money from someone who has apparently said that every time he sees Diane Abbott, it makes him hate black people and that she should be shot. So in every interview that Michael Gove has given today, he has been asked that. This is Sky News. Again, I just focus on the, on the final point of this question, which is, can someone really apologise for a racist comment, which is what the Prime Minister thinks these comments were, without acknowledging 
that the comments were racist? Well, again, I haven't spoken to uh, Mr Hester, but I think that uh, when someone says that they are sorry, and I understand he's deeply sorry for these remarks, then uh, my natural inclination is uh, to exercise Christian forgiveness. Yeah, and he was asked three times uh, that question. And uh, so apparently Christian forgiveness is what we need to show rather than just uh, forgiveness. Yeah, and Gove appears to be in a, a generous or forgiving mood, at least for some people as well, because he was also asked today about Paul Marshall. Now, of course, listeners to this show will be aware of Paul Marshall because we did an investigation with Hope Not Hate into him. He's one of the big investors of GB News. He's also, funnily enough, been a major donor to the Conservative Party in the past, not given as much money as Mr Hester, but has given half a million pounds to the Conservative uh, Party. We revealed that he had been liking and retweeting, by anyone's measure, I think, extremist material, xenophobic material, nativist material, Islamophobic material, homophobic material. He then said that, it didn't represent his views, etc. But Michael Gove was asked in the House of Commons by the Labour MP for Hammersmith, Andy Slaughter, about that investigation this afternoon. This is what he said. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, this tweet was liked by Sir Paul Marshall. Civil war is coming. There has never been a country that has remained peaceful with a sizable Islamic presence. Once the Muslims get to 15 to 20 per cent of the population, the current cold civil war will turn hot. Many other incendiary tweets were liked or retweeted by Marshall, a substantial donor to both the Tory party and the Secretary of State personally, according to a recent Hope Not Hate news agent's investigation. How does the Secretary of State square his definition of extremism with accepting money from someone like Marshall? Well, I deprecate the personal attack on Sir Paul Marshall, who is a, a distinguished philanthropist and the supporter of ARC Academies, which are state schools that have done so much, including in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency, to improve the lives of disadvantaged children from a variety of minority backgrounds. Yeah, you can be a distinguished philanthropist and still have some views that are reprehensible, but the utter refusal to countenance anything that Paul Marshall has said as being unacceptable when, you know, uh, Andy Slaughter quoted one of the tweets and we quoted an, an awful lot more is extraordinary. I think it's worse than that, John. I think it's disgraceful. I think Gove's response there was disgraceful and the height of hypocrisy. I completely agree with him that we need to be cognizant of and mindful of and wary of the growth of extremism in our society. Absolutely. I think that has is a big problem. And it, and, it, and it manifests itself in different ways. It's not just the far right. Yes, there is a problem with, with Islamism. It's it's not as ubiquitous, I think, as the government at the moment is trying to say. They're often trying to like point at everyone at the Gaza protest and saying they're all Islamists, or more or less, which is clearly untrue. But that investigation revealed that Paul Marshall, who is a you know big figure in conservative politics, was liking and retweeting material that was, by, as I say, by any stretch of the imagination, outrageous, that was prophesizing civil war because Muslims were part of our society, that was Islamophobic and so on. And I would have a lot more time for Gove's critique today and what Gove was saying today if it felt like it was intellectually coherent and intellectually honest and willing to look at everybody or anybody who, for whatever reason, and they can accept, they can offer contrition for it or explanation for it, but are finding themselves confronted with extremist material and in some way amplifying it, which is what Marshall did. And Gove's response instead is just to say, well, the fact that he's donated money to certain things or is a great philanthropist is somehow exculpatory. It isn't. It cannot be. So I think, Michael Gove, if we're going to take this set of ideas seriously, I think the Conservative Party needs to look inward at it itself and ask itself seriously and properly, are we ourselves being as even-handed as we can be when we look at people that we like. Because if you're against extremism, then you have to be honest to yourself and say, I'm against extremism, even from when it's people on our, roughly speaking, our own side. Otherwise, it is hollow and it is empty. It's exactly right. I think that extremism is not just of the left and of Islamism. No. It is of white supremacy, which I saw a lot in America. It is of Islamophobia, it is of homophobia. The Conservative Party won't even say it Islamophobia is, anymore. Yes, and I think there is a fear there because the Conservative Party thinks, ooh, that's a lot of our supporters who might like that stuff and if we say that out loud, then they might shun us at the next election. Well, I'm sorry, 
if you're pump, if you're planting a flag in the ground to say that we support the values of tolerance and liberal parliamentary democracy, then you have to call it out from wherever it comes. And if that is inconvenient, tough. If it's inconvenient that it's come from Hester, who says that he wants a black woman shot, and if it's Paul Marshall, who has retweeted posts that the cold civil war with Muslims is going to get hot, I'm afraid tough. You've got to call it out from wherever it comes and you've got to have the intellectual honesty and confidence to do that. And then Michael Gove's statement today would command much more support rather than people just arching an eyebrow. And what I find depressing about it is they will think, oh, bloody politicians, he's just trying to do it to one side for narrow advantage and he's not playing this fairly. Exactly, because the truth is, and this has not just happened in Britain, it's happened all over Europe, we've reported on it on this show and, and in the US, the political conversation on the right in particular recently, but it's happened on the left in the past as well, but it's, it's been more common on the right recently just because far-right parties and extreme-right parties are doing better than far-left parties or, or, or left-wing parties. The conversation on the right in European and American politics has been becoming more extreme. And some of that is just responding to events and it can be legitimate, and some of it is objectively deeply, deeply problematic. And you have been seeing, you've seen the sort of centre of gravity of the right, of the political right, being dragged quite substantially rightward. So I would welcome Michael Gove and indeed other, I think, you know, in many ways, Gove is a very thoughtful man. I would welcome Michael Gove and others thinking within the conservative family, thinking seriously about that and thinking about what voices we think should be in the tent and what ideas should be outside of the tent. But it doesn't seem to me on the basis of anything that's happened this week that that is even close to happening. And indeed, the message we've got at the end of this week, right, was basically, if you're rich... If you're rich yeah. and you are willing to give money to us or you're on the side, roughly on our side, then frankly, the bar for you and your extremist view to what you say is in a very different place than it would be for anybody else. And that is just not only intellectually incoherent, but it just is disturbing. And it just means that why should we listen to anybody talking about extremism in that in that in that moment? Well, I think we can square another circle, which is the interview I did last week, which was following on from your Marshall investigation mm. um, with Jeff Zucker, um, who is heading the bid to try and buy the Telegraph for this uh, Redbird IMI group, which involves uh, the, the Sheikh Mansour of Abu Dhabi. And, you know, he was saying, look, our bid should go ahead. It's not a government bid from Abu Dhabi. It's going to have editorial independence. What you can discern from what Michael Gove said in the Commons today almost is, well, yeah, we can't have Abu Dhabi money. But if we've got money from somebody who is uh, retweeting stuff of an Islamophobic, homophobic nature, well, that's fine. He's a good guy. He's a distinguished philanthropist. Yeah. Take their money. But no, we don't want that Arab money. Well, exactly. And also, I mean, if the tortoise stories, which we referenced at the top, is true, which is that Hester has, in fact, not just donated £10 million, but there's another five million waiting to be disclosed in the next round of of um, electoral commission declarations. That again, as Starmer was saying in the interview I did with him, uh, does go a long way to explain why the Conservative Party has been so eager to defend him all week. Because even though the actual example of racism was obviously completely cut and dry, because 15 million, bear in mind that the the newly uprated campaign spending limit is now 35 million so hester's donation alone is worth 42 percent of the entire conservative war chest for the election and in that guise or viewed through look through that lens you see why they've been doing what they've been doing and although you can kind of see the real politic of that what it does mean and conservative candidates have to ask themselves this right when if let's say there is an election in may that means election leaflets are going to be printed uh, there's going to be materials, internet ads bought, all the rest of it. Conservative activists and MPs around the country are basically using a guy who has expressed deeply racist views and is using his money to pay for their election. And I think there will be a lot of Conservatives who are uncomfortable with that. Maybe there are some who aren't. But I think there will be a lot who are. And the Conservative Party has made no attempt this week to really account for that. You go back to Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein and Deep Throat saying... Follow the money. Yeah. Follow the money and see where it leads you. Well, this week we have sort of followed the money 
and it's led to Frank Hester. And as you say, over 40 percent potentially of what the Conservative Party is going to spend in the general election campaign will have come from him, a slightly, some would say immensely, discredited individual after what he said. And before we leave this edition of the News Agents, I am delighted to say we have been joined by the Sports Agents and one Gabby Logan. And Gabby, um, what's on your show today, apart from a little bit of me being boring? You were fantastic and it was the mashup I've been looking for for a while. What a perfect confluence of American politics and sport, which please chappers no end because it involved NFL. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about multi-club ownership. Uh, Michael Edwards used to be the director of football, sporting director at Liverpool and he's been away for a couple of years and he's coming back in an exalted role, um, CEO of football. And one of the big tasks he's got is to buy Liverpool and the Fenway Group, who own Liverpool, another club and when you look into this there are 13 Premier League clubs who already own multiples not just one club but in Manchester City's case they own 13 other clubs so we want to look at what that means for financial fair play is this a way to circumnavigate that and who's regulating it because actually ultimately it becomes a potentially another area that's unfair for smaller clubs doesn't it if, if you've got access to all those players and actually the positives of that is there a side where it's helping development of players and coaches and then we had Eddie Hearn in which was I heard some of that yeah, fantastic which is listen. fantastic this is right off the back of course of AJ's win in Saudi Arabia last week we'd, we'd previewed that we looked ahead to it and, and said fighting an MMA fighter was, was quite a dangerous road for AJ to get himself back in the public's consciousness as a great fight it, it worked and Eddie of course talks well on a, a myriad of subjects um, so that was great and then we had John Sopel in the sports <laughs> agents which was a personal highlight and what we were talking about was the fact that Robert F. Kennedy Jr who's running as an independent might be taking on uh, one of America's most famous quarterbacks uh, Aaron Rodgers as his running mate and it is not uncontroversial that's <laughs> all on the sports agents Gabby be lovely to see you nice and see you uh, yeah you can find the sports agents I'll have my chair back now thank you goodbye the news agents this is a global player original podcast 